Well, I told Dara I was going to start with a little story. Um, I'm a 4-H mom in Kansas now, and, and our fall livestock show has a little contest where the kids have to do a skill and give a speech and all that stuff. And my daughter was assigned the speech to, to talk about a problem in beef cattle industry, and so she decided to talk about reproduction. I said, okay, go, go to the computer, go Google some stuff, find some information and bring it back, and we'll talk about what reputable sources are, because, you know, you can find some crazy stuff online. So she comes back a little bit later. She says, Mom, I found this article by a guy. I can't say his name, but he's from Kentucky. It's Dar or something. Is that a reputable source? <laughs> we said, well, actually, academically, absolutely. Otherwise, maybe a little sketchy, but, but yeah, that's a, good, that's a good reputable source. So yeah. Google found you uh, in that case. Uh, but I'm very excited to be able to to be here today to talk a little bit about crossbreeding. I do have to say though that I feel like I'm giving a physics lecture to Einstein because Dr. Larry Cundiff is sitting here in the audience and um, that's a little intimidating to talk about crossbreeding um, in front of somebody of his uh, experience and stature, but um, if I get something wrong, Larry, you jump right up and correct me. So um, like Dara said, I teach at K-State and I've taught animal breeding for a lot of years now. And so one of the topics we talk about quite a bit is crossbreeding. And so one of the things we start out with and, and we talk to our students about is that really, as an animal breeder, you've only got two decisions to make. You have to make selection and then you have to make a mating system. Only two things, right? How easy can that be? And then we spend the next 16 weeks talking about that. So it, it does get more complex. But when we talk about selection and mating, we're talking about, first of all, selection is improving that additive piece of genetic merit, and that's our EPDs, okay? Improving cattle through the use of EPDs. But then taking that genetic merit that we've improved through EPDs and using mating systems to match that correctly and hopefully optimize heterosis and get some breed complementarity. Okay, so that's one question I always ask on an animal breeding exam. What are the two tools of an animal breeder? But another question I always ask is what are the benefits of crossbreeding? And again, there's two. The answer, there's two, two answers to that question. One is heterosis, and the other is breed complementarity. And we'll talk uh, about both of those things. So first of all, what is heterosis? And we probably all have an idea in our, our mind, but when we think about what it is at its basis, it's really just how much better is a crossbred progeny than he should be. Okay, and so another term you might hear is hybrid vigor. That's the same thing. Heterosis is the same as hybrid vigor. But if we think about the mean for breed one or breed A and the mean for breed B, those crossbred progeny should be right in the middle, right? They, they're half breed A, they're half breed B. They should be right in the middle. But sometimes they're more superior than that. Okay, they're better than their expectation. And that's what I'm showing here on the left. In this case, we have an offspring, the actual AB, that is even better than both parental breeds, and sometimes we see that. But we also might have heterosis, where we've got divergent breed A and breed B, where the half-blood progeny aren't better necessarily than both breeds, but they're still better than we expect them to be. Okay, I think the best example of the, that right-hand scenario would be our, our dairy industry, right? Most people are milking straight-bred or mostly straight-bred Holstein cows. And that's because even though there is some heterosis for milk production, that Holstein cow is so superior that the, the half-bloods uh, can't exceed her. Okay, so heterosis is simply the fact that those crossbred progeny are better than they should be based just on their breed composition. Okay, so we're going to dive a little bit more into the genetic basis for this and why we have heterosis. <laughs> and so what happens at the gene level when you crossbreed is you actually get more heterozygous gene pairs, right? That's where the word comes from. Heterosis is heterozygosity. So we get more, in this example, big A, little a genes and less big, big, or little, little. And that's absolutely the opposite of inbreeding. Heterosis and inbreeding are two sides of the same coin. When we inbreed, we get more homozygosity, more big A, big A, and little a, little a. Now, that's one fact. The second that we need to understand is that in general, on average, most of the time, the less favorable allele of a gene pair is recessive. Now, I have tend in big letters because it's not always true. 
But in general, the, re the less favorable allele tends to be recessive. And the best way to understand that is to think about what if it wasn't, okay? Let's say, what if the dominant allele was the bad allele? Okay, and so on this example on the left-hand side, if we've got a lethal allele, okay, something that kills the animal, if it's dominant, that means both big A, big A, and big A, little A are dead. What happens to that defect in the population? It's gone, right? The only animals left to reproduce are little A, little A. Okay, so lethal dominants don't live in the population very long. What about a polygenic trait? Okay, a trait like weaning weight or carcass quality or fertility or all the traits that we care about and have EPDs for. Okay, there's hundreds of genes that affect those traits. We don't know how many, hundreds. But they all have a little effect. And so in the same scenario, if the dominant allele was the unfavorable allele, and maybe in this case it's a few pounds of weaning weight. It's not lethal, it's just a few pounds of weaning weight. But over time, if we're selecting for increased weaning weights, for example, you can see how over time we're going to select fewer of those big A, big A animals, aren't we? They're on average a little bit lighter. Eventually, that big A will be selected out of the population. Okay, so again, the point of this is that in general, the, the less favorable alleles, the bad stuff, tends to be recessive. Okay, so here's why that's, that's important to understand heterosis. Okay, so we're going to go through an example. And this is one of the cool things that has come out of genomics in the last uh, few years, is starting to understand some of these embryonic lethals. These um, lethal alleles that kill that embryo before it ever implants even. So we never knew the cow got bred, she just came up open. Well, she actually did have a conception, but it died. Okay, so let's say we've got a breed, doesn't matter, just any breed. And they've got some lethal allele at gene A. Okay, so those recessive little a, little a's, they die at day 10 or day 15 or whatever, very early in embryonic development. Cow came up open, we never knew they existed. Okay, well, if breed one is carrying this around in their gene pool, some of those animals are heterozygote for that gene. And sometimes those two animals end up mating. And here's a kind of square you probably all saw in your biology classes where if you've got a bull and a cow that are both carriers of this lethal allele, we know that 25% of those offspring will not survive. And in this case, they didn't survive. Um, and we never saw them. We didn't know they didn't survive. Okay, and so now we're in this example, we've got to have another breed, a totally different breed, and they've got a different embryonic lethal, gene B. Okay, but the exact same scenario. It's floating around in that breed at some low level, and when you happen to have two carriers mate, you have a 25% chance of that being a, a lethal em an embryo that doesn't survive. Okay, so now let's look at these breeds, and let's just say I'm, I'm making up an example of this lethal in breed A. We're going to say that in this gene pool, there's 80% big A alleles and 20% little A's. Okay, it could be anything. I'm making that up. But that little a is floating around in those animals at 20% frequency. However, breed one doesn't carry the other, the B allele. They don't carry the bad B. They're all homozygous for B. So what happens when we cross purebred A and purebred B? Or sorry, purebred A to purebred A? Well, we can see that when that bull goes to make sperm, 80% of his sperm have the good A allele. And 20% of bull sperm, and this is thinking of bulls as a group in that breed, 20% have that little A that's bad. Everybody's good for B. We don't worry about that right now. Cows down the side, they're the same. 80% of the cows' eggs have the normal big A. 20% of the eggs made by that cow herd are going to carry that recessive lethal. Okay, well, when we cross those bulls and those cows, okay, you can do the math and figure out that we make a whole bunch of animals that are completely normal, we make some carriers, and we have 4% in this example, 4% embryonic lethals, which we basically see as 4% less pregnant cows. Okay, that makes sense? Okay, breed B, or sorry, breed 2, that is a carrier for that lethal little B allele. And I'm just saying in this particular population, it's at 10% frequency. Again, it could be whatever. But the same kind of a situation where these bulls from breed two, 
90% of the sperm have that normal big B. 10% are carriers of that little B. Cows are the same way. So for this particular gene in this population, we have about a 1% pregnancy loss when we pure breed these animals. So what do you think I'm going to do now? Right. Okay, so let's take breed one. Their frequencies, remember, were 80% and 20% for gene A, but they're all good for B. They're 100% homozygous normal for B. Okay, and then our second breed was 90 and 10 for the, the lethal B allele, but they're completely homozygous for breed A. So when we cross them, we've got the sperm on the top for breed one. 80% of them are big A, big B, but 20% carry the, the lethal little A. Our cows from breed two, 90% have the big B, 10% are carriers of that lethal little B. We don't have any pregnancy loss here, do we? We haven't created any animals that are little a, little a, or little b, little b. Okay, the, the different breeds are covering up each other's problem in this case. Okay, at the gene level, this really is what heterosis is. Okay, it's covering up the bad stuff that might exist within a breed. And 0% pregnancy loss for this example. Okay, so let's think about it, maybe zoom out from the individual gene level and think maybe chromosome level. And so this is representing, these little lines are representing chromosomes. Now, do cattle have four pair of chromosomes? No. Anybody know? How many chromosomes? 30 pair, right? Bovines have 30 pair of chromosomes. We're just drawing four because 30 is too much to draw. But if we cross breed one and breed two, we're representing breed one as black chromosomes, breed two as red chromosomes. So when we have that half-blood, that F1 cow, every single one of her chromosome pairs has one from one breed, one from the other. Every one of her chromosome pairs is crossbred. You don't have any purebred alleles matching up with each other. They are all crossbred. Okay, that's heterosis. Now, the question I'm going to ask is, what happens with that F1 heifer then? Okay, so there's some thought. I've heard people say, well, once you crossbreed a crossbreed, crossbreed a crossbred, the heterosis goes away. But that's not true. We do retain heterosis. Now, we don't very often retain all of it, and that's a problem that we'll get to, but we do retain some. Well, how does that work? Okay, well, here's our F1 heifer that we just made of a cross between this black chromosome breed and the red chromosome breed. Let's say we take that heifer and cross her back on her sire breed. Not her sire, it's the same picture, but let's assume it's a different sire of that breed. Well, that sire, when he makes a sperm, every chromosome in that sperm is a, from that breed, right? They're all black chromosomes. But when that cow goes to make an egg, it's a random choice at every chromosome between the black or the red. Maybe chromosome one is black, and chromosome two is black, and chromosome three is red. It's random. Okay, so on average, every egg will have about half red chromosomes and half black chromosomes. So when that egg and sperm come together, you're going to have, on average, half the time, a black chromosome and a black chromosome together. So basically a purebred chromosome pair. But half the time, on average, you will have a black chromosome with a red chromosome, so a crossbred chromosome pair. So that back cross heifer, in this case, is going to have, on average, 50% heterosis, 50% of what the original had. What about if you intercross two of those F1s? So let's say we made some bulls and some heifers from our purebred cross, and then we breed them together. Well, in this case, we've got a lot more options of what can happen. Maybe the bull puts the black chromosome one in the sperm and the red chromosome two, and you can think about all the possibilities. The cow does the same thing on the egg. So you could have a chromosome pair that's two black chromosomes, so purebred from breed one. You could have two red chromosomes come together, so purebred from breed two. Or you could have the mix and match black chromosome from the sire, red chromosome from the dam, and vice versa. Again, on average, 
of the heterosis that you had in the original. Now there's one more little complication here. Okay, so we've talked about, I haven't said the word, but we've been talking about random segregation. The idea that sperm and egg randomly are pulling a black or a red chromosome in this case. But we also know that during the process of sperm and egg formation, we get what's called recombination. So in an F1 that has a chromosome from breed one and a chromosome from breed two, they might break and switch off parts of their chromosomes. So now not only do we have random segregation, we've got some of these chromosomes chopped up into bits of different breed compositions. So that retained heterosis is going to be um, something that we can predict on average, but there's going to be a variability around that. Okay, part of that is due to the relationship between breeds. If you have two very closely related breeds, they're going to have chromosome segments that are the same, basically. But also, because of this random segregation and recombination, we're going to get some individuals, if you had a full sieve family, some of those individuals will have a little more red or a little more black, and you'll have some variation around that 50%. But we will retain that heterosis at some percentage. Okay, so what does that mean? How does heterosis help us? Well, it turns out that heritability and heterosis are inversely related. And so we know that heritability is the, is the value that lets us predict how good a job we can do with selection. For highly heritable traits, we know that we can make really good progress using our EPDs. Okay, for lowly heritable traits, we can still make progress using EPDs. I'd probably get run out of this room if I said otherwise. We still for sure can make progress. But for lowly heritable traits, it's harder. It takes longer and it's slower. But what's interesting is that the boost, the benefit that we get from heterosis is higher for those traits that's harder to make selection progress on. So we get a really big bang for our buck on things like fertility, survivability, longevity, health. We get a lot of boost from heterosis for those traits. Not so much when we think about end product traits. There's not as much heterosis for something like a carcass tree in general. Now, if I was going to ask this crowd of those traits for a commercial cow-calf producer, which are the most economically important? Which of those groups? Probably the reproduction, right? And this is a very classic paper that Melton wrote, an ag economist, back in the 90s, and I haven't seen an update that, that's better yet, uh, but showed that for a, a cow-calf producer, reproduction is 10 times more important than end product, with growth in the middle. Okay, I think that's probably not as much now, but if there's no calf born, it doesn't matter how good of a carcass he would have had, right? So reproduction is still king for a cow-calf producer, and we know the heterosis is really going to help us there. And here's where I'll tip my hat again to Dr. Cundiff and his uh, colleagues at Mark, because most of the work, the really great work that's been done in heterosis has been done at Mark since, I don't know, the 60s, 50s maybe. They started working on, on crossbreeding and measuring heterosis. And the number that's thrown out a lot is from kind of the classic studies was somewhere around 20 or so percentage improvement in uh, weaning weight per cow exposed by having crossbred calves and crossbred cows. Okay, a huge improvement in productivity of cattle because of being crossbred. Now, some of that is due to the crossbred calves having superior growth. That's the yellow bar. But a bigger part of that improvement is due to the crossbred cows being more fertile and having more calves. In fact, some of the data shows that a crossbred cow lives somewhere a little bit over a year longer in the herd, has about one more calf during her lifetime, which translates to about 600 pounds of weaning weight between that extra calf and all the other calves weighing a little more. Okay, 600 pounds that that cow produces in her lifetime. There is an advantage to the calves. Okay, the, they survive a little bit better. Um, you do get a little bit more birth weight, maybe a couple pounds. Um, more weaning weight, more growth, more yearling weight. Okay, so these are not huge improvements, 3 4%, but it adds up. Cumulative improvement in calf, uh, pounds of calf meat. 
Okay, that was some older data, but some of the newer data even out of Mark shows kind of the same thing. Um, this was a study from uh, 2015 uh, from Mark, and they grouped the breeds um, for a little more power, just British by British, British by continental, and continental by continental. And these are kilograms, so in your head multiply by about two to make them pounds. But when you have, for example, British by British cross, you're gonna get about a pound more birth weight, but somewhere around 13, 14 more pounds of weaning weight, and I don't know, 35, 40 pounds more yearling weight. Okay, and you can see the differences between the different kinds of crosses. And so this would be, I believe this was the cycle seven cattle, so much more recent animals still showing that advantage to having crossbred calves. Okay, another question we hear though, oh my gosh, crossbreds are so variable. The purebreds are much more uniform. Well, the mark data would, would say that's not true either. That a good structured crossbreeding system can produce progeny that are just as uniform as the purebreds. And so in their data, they've compared the coefficient of variation, which is just the measure of variability of purebreds and then their composite animals and there's really not much difference there. Those composites were pretty much as uniform as the purebreds for these traits. Okay, so that's really heterosis and what heterosis can do for you. Breed complementarity is an interesting one. And I would say that our colleagues in the swine industry probably do this better than anybody, where they've got a, a really good system for the, the white breeds, right? The, the different lines of Yorkshire type animals, Yorkshire's, Chester's, large whites where they've got those maternal breeds that they've selected for fertility, for litter size, for pre-weaning growth. And they cross those on the terminal type breeds, right, that have been selected for growth and carcass traits. Okay, so mixing the best of both worlds. And that's the idea of utilizing breed complementarity to try to match your females, your cows, to your production system and make a maternal cow and cross that on a more terminal breed to make a market animal that's more, uh, more suited to the market. But the question I hear a lot is, okay, well in the 60s and 70s our breeds were pretty different, but the mark data from more recently shows that the breeds have gotten more similar. Do we still have complementarity? And my answer, I think it's yes, maybe not what we did in the 70s, but there are certainly differences between breeds and there are certainly different lines and different sires within different breeds that allow us to, to match those together and take advantage of that complementarity. But I wanna do a little caveat because I do hear, again, I get the question, well, crossbreds are always better then, right? Crossbreds are always better than purebreds. Like, no, I'm not saying that, right? Because if you have, a excellent quality breed one and an excellent quality breed two and you cross them, you're gonna make a great crossbred. But if you have a pretty mediocre breed one and a pretty mediocre breed two, you're gonna have a pretty mediocre crossbred. Okay, so crossbreeding can't get you out of bad cattle. Okay, you can't take bad cattle, cross them and make good cattle. Crossbreeding doesn't take the place of selection, but it can add on, right? It's a complement to selection. And I'm gonna go back to a little math, not much there, just a little bit. But if we think about our basic genetic model for these polygenic traits, okay, the phenotype, that's what we measure, that's our weaning weight, that's our marbling score, that's whatever the data is. We've got some group effect, but we know we've got genetics and environment. Okay, that unexplained variation, we, a lot of times we'll think of that as environment. But that genetic piece can actually be divided up. Okay, the genetics are made up of two bits, well actually three bits, two that we can at least get a handle on. The additive genetic part, that A, that's the breeding value, that's the EPD part. The dominance effects, getting that big A matched with the little a, that's the heterosis effect. And so you can see they're additive. If you've got really bad EPD cattle, a good dominance effect is not gonna save you. But if you've got good A and good D, right, they work together to produce good cattle. So if we think about sort of the bottom line, for commercial cattlemen producing calves to go to market, they need to care both about A and D, right? Get good A and then match it correctly to get your heterosis right and get good D. 
seed stock producers that are producing bulls and maybe heifers for those commercial producers, they need to focus on additive. They focus on EPDs. They make selection to make those cattle the best they can be, but then allow their commercial customers to match those in a way to take advantage of the heterosis. Okay, and so one of the really big problems we've had with crossbreeding and why um, a lot of us think maybe that it hasn't been adopted as much or as well as it should is that crossbreeding systems are, can be, not are, they can be pretty difficult. They can be complex and they can be hard to manage. And this is why, because in beef cattle, as well as maybe sheep and a few other things, we basically like to keep our own replacement heifers, right? We raise our own heifers. Okay, like we talked about our friends in the swine industry, when a commercial hog producer needs more gilts, does he raise them himself or herself? Or they call up their seed stock supplier and say, I need 100 gilts next week. Right? They can buy in the gilts that they need of the appropriate breed composition. In the beef industry, we like to raise our own replacement heifers. And we know that this F1 has the maximum amount of heterosis. Okay, we know that's the best scenario for heterosis. The problem is, what do we breed her to? Okay, and so I ask this question to my students. I say, okay, well, we made this F1. She's perfect. We love her. What are we going to breed her to? And they think about it for a minute. And then somebody says, well, just another breed. Breed C. Like, okay, that, that's fine. So now we have a, another generation of animals that are half breed C, and they've got some breed A and some breed B. But we want to keep those daughters too. What do we breed them to? And then somebody will say, breed D. Say, okay, you guys realize that pretty soon we're going to run out of breeds, right? We can't do this forever. And so that's the crux of the problem with crossbreeding systems. If we, is we've got to figure out how to put a system in place that allows us to keep our heifers, but also allows us to optimize heterosis. And notice I'm going to say optimize because we can't maximize it. We cannot keep it at its maximum level, like this F1 cow, and keep replacement females. We can't do that. And so we've come up with systems that will help us manage that. The problem is that, that some of them are pretty complex. Um, some of them require three or four bulls. This is something else I tell my students. Okay, you graduated, you're a consultant, you go to a producer that is looking to implement a crossbreeding system. They've got 30 cows and you give them a system that requires three breeds of bull. You're fired, right? It has to make sense. A crossbreeding system has to make sense with the number of animals, for example, that the producer has. It has to produce replacement heifers. And you've got to be able to produce replacement heifers that are going to make good cows. And we are in a situation where sometimes the most um, efficient cow is not the necessarily the same as the most efficient market progeny. So how do we balance those concerns and replace our, uh, replace our herd, but also produce progeny for the market that work. Okay, another problem that we might have, especially in small herds, is if you have just a handful of animals of lots of different breed compositions, that's hard to market as a load lot, right? We need big load lot groups of uniform animals to market. And depending on the system, that can be a challenge. And obviously environment and management is gonna constrain any system. When we talk about the different systems, We've got rotational systems where we're switching out breeds of sire um, or between different um, breeding pastures. That requires at least a couple of breeds of sire. Terminal systems work great if you've got a source of female. Okay, and that's difficult for beef cattle. Um, there are some systems that combine those two. But of course, we also have in the last couple of decades more access to composite seed stock than we ever did. And that's another way that can help us to manage these crossbreeding systems and, and optimize our heterosis. But always remember, we're trying to optimize that heterosis. It can't be maximum, but we can optimize it. We'd like to have relatively uniform lots of calves to sell, and it's got to be able to keep going. When I ask the students, and what will you breed those daughters to? And what will you breed those daughters to? That answer has to be apparent in the system. And so um, we're not going to go into different crossbreeding systems, but I would reference you um, to the Sire Selection Manual. It's online, and there's probably a few hard copies still floating around out there, but it has a really nice chapter on the different kinds of crossbreeding systems 
and how you might manage those to optimize that heterosis and take advantage of re-complementarity. So I was given 30 minutes, so I'm going to wrap it up. Um, for genetic improvement, we've got two things we can do. We make selection. We utilize EPDs to make cattle the best they can be. And then we mate them appropriately to take advantage of both heterosis and breed complementarity. Those are the two tools that we have that we can utilize.